Buchanan, Provost at Salisbury University, and it's my privilege to welcome you to yet another Spring Ryle Lecture. We are so fortunate every year to bring to our campus wonderful speakers from the field of education. I bring you official greetings on behalf of our president, Janet Dudley Eschbach, the students, the faculty, and the staff of Salisbury University. I'm now going to call on somebody who knows what's going on tonight, our Dean, Dennis Botanichak from the Seidel School. Good evening and welcome. It's my pleasure to add my welcome to the provost to this exciting lecture series. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about why we have this lecture series here. Um, as you know, the education department is located in Carruthers Hall, and as you may not know, but if you've been there, we'll have guessed that Carruthers Hall is a former elementary school. The principal of that elementary school for a number of years was a woman named Pauline Ryle, who was a rather imposing woman who most of the children felt had no sense of humor at all. Uh, Ms. Ryle taught a lot of lessons <clears throat> to the children there. I heard a couple of stories about them tonight at dinner. But when she was nearing the end of her life, she made it clear that she wanted to leave her estate to Salisbury University and to make sure that two things happened. One is that award, an award was made in her name to an aspiring teacher, and the other was that a lecture series be established that would bring educators to Salisbury University for the benefit of the students here. And when I look at that legacy on the back of your program, <clears throat> Of the speakers who have been at Salisbury University, I look at the names. Ernest Boyer, Madeline Hunter, Mary Budrow, James Comer, Elliot Eisner, Cornell West, Maxine Green, Herb Cole, Alfie Cohn, Jonathan Kozel, Luis Garden Acosta, Linda Darling Hammond, Nell Noddings, Salome Thomas L., Carol Ann Tomlinson, and I think what an exceptional place to draw this kind of quality of speakers to a campus. We are so pleased that Cheryl Kirkendall is joining that group tonight. We are so pleased. It is truly a hall of fame and we know that you are deserving. Um, I also want to recognize someone tonight um, who has not been able to come to this lecture series in the last couple years. I'd like Lynn Seidel to stand. Lynn, where are you? Raise your hand, Lynn. <laughs> you may recognize the name Seidel for the Seidel School of Education and Professional Studies. It was Lynn Seidel and her late husband, Sam, who provided the endowment for the Seidel School, and the faculty and students of the Seidel School will be forever grateful. Thank you, Lynn. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the brains behind this organization tonight, the chair of the committee that puts together this lecture series, Dr. Laura Morasco. Thank you, Dean Patanacek. This is my first year as chair of the Ryle Committee, and as a faculty member in the Seidel School and a lifelong learner and educator, one of the things that's been most important in, in my learning and my teaching has been mentoring. And I just want to take a moment to say that everything that goes into the Ryle and all of the work my, kid, my committee and I have done this year couldn't have been possible without the former Ryle mentor, and that is Pat Richards. If Dr. Richards would stand and please be acknowledged. For those of you who lead organizations or are chairs of committee, you know all of the work that goes into putting a, a certain event on uh, for your particular organization. And I want to take a minute just to go through the departments on campus who have made this whole evening and tomorrow's informal lecture possible. 
We have special thanks to the President's Office, to event services, conference planning, the physical plant, the horticulture department, public relations, publications, TV services, dining services, university police, KDP students, the Seidel School faculty and staff, and the Ryle Committee members this year, Drs. Carolyn Bowden, Nomsid Galetta, Ted Gilkey, and Claudia Petty. And we thank you all for making this a very special event, the 18th anniversary series of Ryle. Before I introduce our Ryle lecturer, I'd like to remind you that you're all invited to the reception following. Dr. Kirkendall has books that will be for sale and she will do book signing in the social room after her presentation. This year's Ryle lecture has come to us in, in a very different way than all of the past speakers that are on the back of your program. And that is, when the Ryle Committee gets together, we look at nominations that have come from all across campus, from all the different schools. Faculty, staff usually send in names. We gather a list, community people, school people, put nominations forth. And the Ryle Committee looks at each one of these names. We look at the books or the presentations, the articles, the public speaking. We look for recommendations. We ask people. Uh, we do everything we possibly can to ensure that the Ryle speakers who come really meet the needs of the mission of our university and especially the mission of the Seidel School. This year, however, at the end of November, I had about 11 students outside my office who were imploring me to make sure that we had Dr. Crystal Kirkendall on our list. And they were persistent, so much so that when the Ryle Committee got together, we did put Dr. Kirkendall's name on our list, and it didn't take us much deep investigation to really affirm what the KDP students had told us from their experience having heard here in Orlando in November at their conference. And so we put the invitation out, and fortunately Dr. Kirkendall was able to accept, and she's here with us tonight. She needs no introduction. She's been here when Salisbury University was formerly Salisbury State University. She made a presentation on campus. And for the past couple of months, I've heard from people in the community, teachers, people who uh, have known her through her presentations or her workshops. And whether it's been someone who's retired or someone just beginning their educational career, the recommendations have all been the same. You, you, you can't miss what she has to say. You will leave the auditorium changed and inspired to go out and do your best for all kids. And with that, I give you Dr. Crystal Kirkendall. this evening. Now wait a minute, I know I'm in the presence of some of the finest human beings on the planet, so I'm going to try that one more time. How is everyone this evening? All right, that's a little bit better. I want to start by thanking Laura for that very warm and wonderful introduction. She has certainly been the hostess with the mostest. Thank you. <laughs> to your provost, your dean, your absent president, all of the faculty, <laughs> to everybody who came out tonight, let me just say thank you. Truly, it is more than an honor to be in your midst today. And you all need to know, let me just make a disclaimer right away. I do not normally speak in dark glasses. <laughs> Woke up this morning and had a busted blood vessel in the right eye. It looks bad. <laughs> but I figure since you all are that far away and maybe the camera won't pick it up, I'll just take them off tonight. <laughs> but if you get close, do not say, ooh, it really does look bad, because then you really, really hurt my feelings. <laughs> but my friends, let me tell you, I take my hat off to those of you who came out tonight. Because your presence here this evening tells me something about you. Oh, I know you weren't just looking for something else to do tonight. You've got enough to do here in Salisbury. But you're here tonight 
I believe, because you care about something very, very precious in this country, something called future. And the older I get, the more concerned I get. Because I'm realizing more and more that for many of our children, the future just ain't what it used to be. And I am concerned. And you ought to be concerned too. Unless you're planning to expire this evening, <laughs> within the hour. But if you're planning to live, and you have the ability to make a difference in this society, you can truly change this thing called future. My research tells me that in too many places around this nation, we're losing young people. And I'm talking about babies killing other babies. I'm talking about young people who are being lost because they drop out of school long before they should. I'm talking about young people who are becoming victims to things like drug abuse, crime, violence. But the reality is, my research tells me that whenever our young people, whenever they get to a point in their lives where they simply don't believe they're going to succeed legitimately on what I like to call that high road of life, when our young teenagers, adolescents, and small children become convinced that they're not going to be prepared to succeed legitimately on that high road of life, when they become convinced that the adults who serve them could care less about their futures, believe me, my friends, these young children and teenagers will then take whatever skills, whatever ingenuity, whatever creativity they think they have, and once they determine they won't make life's high road, they start down life's low road. And when they start down that low road, they become ripe for all of the crime, the drugs, the violence. When our young people start down life's low road, we all pay a price. I accepted the invitation to be with you today, not because I was looking forward to finally getting back to Salisbury. <laughs> I'm with you today, not because I was looking forward to missing dinner with a 19-year-old son who I know misses me. <laughs> no, I'm with you because I care about the lives of our young people. I care about the lives of children. I care about the lives of teenagers. But I care even more about each and every one of you. Because you see, in my eyes, you're more than just students who happen to have chosen education as a major. You're more than just practitioners who are out there on the front line as teachers and administrators. In my eyes, each and every one of you is a true merchant of hope. Now, I want you to think for a few seconds about that four-letter word called hope. Think about that one word. This nation of ours is still known around the world as the land of opportunity. I'm sharing with you a sweatshirt, and these happens to be sweatshirts my company produces. And if you're sitting in the back and you can't read the words, it says, proud to be a merchant of hope. This nation is still known around the world as the land of opportunity. There's still folks who risk their lives coming to our shores. Oh, we witnessed incredible demonstrations around this nation just last week because of immigration laws that are being changed. And that the reality is those who come, whether they come legally or illegally, whether they come by boat, by train, by bus, by car, by inner tube, or by foot, those who come still come brimming with something called hope. But the sad truth is, we've got children born and raised right here in this country. Many of them are walking the halls of some of our schools, roaming the streets of some of our very communities. And the sad truth is, far too many of our children are facing future without the one thing we know will give their lives more meaning. And believe me, my friends, when children face future with no hope for something better, when we have young folks who can't get excited over the promise of their own unique potential, 
when our children can't get happy over a new day, when there is no hope, we can expect the worst. Because when there is no hope, there will be anger. When there is no hope, there will be bitterness. When there is no hope, there will be frustration, alienation. When there is no hope, we can even expect something called rage. And what we've seen sweep across this country in too many towns, too many cities, too many counties, too many states is the kind of hopelessness, anger, alienation, and rage that I've seen destroy not only lives, but whole communities. My friends, as merchants of hope, you've got a golden opportunity on a daily basis, not just to make a difference in the lives of others, but in so doing, you'll make a powerful difference in your own life as well. So I'm gonna talk to you from the heart. I already made up my mind when I got that warning from one of Maryland's finest who stopped me on the way here. <laughs> I said, that's all right, I'm having a good time when I get to Salisbury tonight. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk to you from my heart. And in the short time that I have with you, I wanna give you some insight. Hopefully I will say something this evening that will not only warm your heart, but quicken your spirit and get you more excited about the roles you do play and you will play as merchants of hope. I'm gonna to touch on a few tips. I call them tips for a terrific tomorrow. I'm gonna to share with you some insight. I'm gonna to touch just a little bit on this thing called diversity, because many of you are going to be challenged as you have never been challenged before to make a difference in the lives of some folks who happen to be different. And remember, you can be the same race as another and still find differences and they will only get in the way if you let them. And you know, I've been around this country quite a few times and I've been amazed because I've run into folks, now I know I'm not talking about anybody here, but I've met those who actually believe that if you're diverse, you must be deficient. Well, I've seen someone think if you're different, you have to be deficient. Those folks don't realize we are stronger as a nation because of our differences. This is the one place that is both a melting pot and a salad bowl. I say both because I've seen four or five nationalities represented in one body. Tiger Woods comes to mind almost immediately. But we're a salad bowl. In this country, you can maintain your unique cultural and racial and ethnic and religious identity. So it's not unusual here to find some lettuce out there with red tomatoes mixed in, black olives for seasoning. We are strong because we are different. And you see, when you accept your calling as a merchant of hope, and it's a high calling, when you accept that calling, one of the challenges you face is the challenge of realizing that we're all products of our own culture. Everyone in this room was a product of your own upbringing. Think about it. It's not unusual for us to see others. It's not even unusual to see situations the way we've been raised to see them. Think about that. If you were raised, for example, believing that blondes have more fun you might have thought about a hair dye. If you were raised believing that people who wear glasses are smarter than those who don't, you might have bought a pair of window panes. But when you accept that calling as a merchant of hope, the challenge is to be able to move beyond that prior orientation so that you can see and appreciate the beauty in others who may have been raised differently. Now, since I'm gonna to touch on diversity, I need to make sure you all are ready for it. You see, whenever I talk to an audience, I don't care how large or small, I don't care how young or old, I don't care what race, religion, creed, or color, my audience is always required to follow the rules of my culture. And I'm from a culture that believes very strongly in something referred to as call and response. Now, I know some of you might be sitting here this evening and you might be thinking, I never heard of that. I don't know what this lady's talking about. That's all right. <laughs> if you never heard of call and response before, then you're going to be my conservative friends this evening. Now, conservative friends only. This is the rule that I want you to follow. Conservative friends, if I say something that you know to be true, Conservative friends, if you find that you can agree with me and you're able to relate to what I'm saying, then conservative friends only. All 
I want you to do is just nod your head like this. <laughs> Give me a big smile. I mean a big one. And that will let me know that you hear me and you follow me. Now let me get a reaction. Only my conservative friends. Heads are nodding. Come on now, big smiles. All right, I see you in the balcony. You're looking good, all right. Now there are others of you, and you know who you are. You are not conservative in the least. You know what I'm talking about when I say call and response. Well, you're going to be my loose friends this evening. Now, loose friends don't let me down. I came a long way for a short time and got a bad eye, so I've got to know you're with me. Now, loose friends, if I say something that you know to be true, if you find that you can agree with me, and you're able to relate to what I'm saying, then loose friends, it's all right. You can say amen. You can say right on. You can say you go, girl. You can laugh out loud. You can clap your hand. You can raise the roof. You can go woof, woof, woof. You can do anything that makes you feel most comfortable. Now, can I please? Can I please get a reaction from all of my loose friends? All right. Now, loose friends, don't let me down. And conservative friends, feel free to cross over at any time. But most importantly, conservative friends, keep those heads nodding. My friends, I came here tonight believing that we all understand we cannot possibly bring out the best in children unless we're willing to give the best of ourselves. Amen. Debbie E.B. Du Bois said it best in 1907. He said, you must become your brother's keeper because if you're not, he'll drag you down in his ruins. Indeed. Over 42 years ago, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. In that great speech he gave, he said, even in a mountain of despair, we must be able to find a stone of hope. As merchants of hope, you'll find many stones. But we'll find many more when we understand how powerfully important it is to be an educator. Do you know it takes a different breed of person to work around children all day long who are not your own. Truly, when you step into the shoes of an educator, you're letting the world know you're a different breed because you can't step into these shoes unless you've got a heart big enough to reach out and to reach down because there will be days when you'll have to lift some up from the gutter. And when you step into these shoes, you're telling the world that you've got a gut strong, enough to hang in there even when the children you serve seem to be courting your rejection once a teacher always a teacher and I taught second grade I taught fifth grade I did time in junior high school <laughs> but don't get me wrong it was wonderful <laughs> fabulous but upon my release for real good behavior, <laughs> I went on and I taught senior English at Central High School in Newark, New Jersey. Now, even if you've never been to Newark, just knowing there's a Central High should tell you something. <laughs> but my work now as a lawyer, and my area of specialty is juvenile justice, has made me more appreciative of the work of educators. Studies tell us now that children who become delinquent, young people who do not realize their full potential, are very often young people who are going through life without having three needs met in their legitimate institutions. Now, we do know that our young people spend approximately six hours a day, Monday through Friday, in our schools. Those of you who teach now, let me see your hands. All current teachers. Teachers, I know it seems longer. <laughs> But the reality is many of our children will interact more with the adults in their school family than some of them will with the adults in their families at home. With such consuming interaction, every educator who is serious about the business of education 
must make certain that every classroom, in every corridor, in every cubbyhole, every cafeteria, these three needs are being met. The first need is the need for something called affection. Do you all know children really are people? I mean, seriously. <laughs> the child will spend six hours a day, Monday through Friday, or even six seconds a day, in an atmosphere where that child feels no love. Trust me, you will see the worst in behavior. And I'm one of these people who believes love is an action word. If you love me, I expect you to show me. And I'm a hugger. I love a good hug. In fact, when this session is over, if you happen to get close to me, and I hope you do, don't walk up to me sticking out your hand. If you get close to me, it's all right for you to give me a hug. But see, I know when it comes to children, other folks' children, I know everybody's not into hugging other folks' children with your arms. I understand that. I'm an attorney. But... <laughs> If you cannot hug someone else's child with your arms, you know what I want you to do? I want you to learn how to hug with your eyes. And I'll show you how easy it is. I want everyone right now. Turn to your neighbor on your left and then turn to the one on your right. Give them both an eye hug. <laughs> Come on, give me an eye hug. Now listen to you. been hugged all day. <laughs> Second need is a need for some, see I know y'all getting carried away. <laughs> Second need is a need for something called appreciation. Young people want to know that we appreciate them for who they are today. Not what we want them to be next week, next year, five years from now when they finally get out of this middle school. They have to know that we appreciate them for who they are right now and they need to know that we want them in our schools. I've seen situations where children have returned to school after a long absence and folks say, <laughs> back so soon. <laughs> they need for appreciation is powerful. And if it's not satisfied on the high road, it will be satisfied on the low road. I'm reminded of the words of a rap artist. In one of his songs, he wrote that when he was a little boy, he hung out with dope dealers and thugs. He said, but even though they sold drugs, they gave a little brother love. That need for affection. That need for appreciation. Those are powerful needs. But it is the third need that is the most powerful. Researchers know now that every student has a need for something called achievement. Hey, wait a minute, you might be saying, Johnny's reading score is 007. Look, the boy's IQ is room temperature. <laughs> Doesn't matter. That need for achievement is so powerful. Young people will satisfy that need one way or the other. When we don't give them a chance to succeed in our schools doing something right, or they find a way to succeed doing something all wrong. Even if it means getting on that teacher's last nerve. When they don't get success in school, they look for success out of school. Even if it means becoming the biggest teenage pharmaceutical representative in the neighborhood. That need for achievement, my friends, will be met one way or the other. Now, if we're going to satisfy all three needs, and as educators, we must. There are some things that we must be willing to do differently. And see, it's good that I'm talking to so many who have not yet stepped into the profession because those who teach know that many educators get caught up in doing things the same way they did it 99,000 years ago. Can I get a head nod? Yeah. We have to be willing to make some changes. And I understand how hard change is. If you've been doing anything for 21 days or longer, change is a challenge. I understand. Look, I was the last one in my neighborhood who got rid of my 8-track. Change was hard. <laughs> it was hard. But today's children have changed, and those of us who teach them must be willing to change, too. You see, research tells us that today's children are far more student-centered than ever before. They bounce ideas off one another. They have to be in classrooms that are also student-centered. I asked for a lapel mic. There was no way in the world I was going to stand behind a podium 
and talk to you tonight. That's too teacher-centered. And I've seen some teachers who teach today's children and, and they stand in one spot all day long and act like they'll get struck by lightning if they move one foot. <laughs> today's children learn best when they are taught through the use of personal examples, anecdotes, and stories. Before this evening is over, you'll be able to tell that's still how I teach. See, I know even if you forget my facts, you'll remember my stories. We know now that children learn best when we teach them with a whole group instruction or we teach them through the use of heterogeneous grouping, cooperative learning, and inclusion. If you've never read a report by the Carnegie Council called Turning Points, I highly recommend it. According to that report, tracking and ability grouping are the most divisive, damaging practices in our schools. We know now that we must teach children by relating learning to their reality. You don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about Farmer Brown and his cow if you've got some kids who've never seen Farmer Brown and don't care nothing about his cow. <laughs> we know now that when we create a climate that is conducive to learning, children will thrive. And when I say climate, I don't mean temperature. That's important. I mean, you don't want to burn them up and you really can't freeze them out. <laughs> but the climate of a classroom is established by the behavior of the adults who are in that room. A teacher's daily mood will dictate the temperature of a classroom. And most of our students are just like us. They're fair weather. I mean, most of us, sunshine, blue skies, balmy temperatures, we love being outdoors. Can I get a head nod? Yeah. Kids are the same way. They're not going to rush to your classroom to be greeted by Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> They're not going to break their necks to get to a classroom when they know it's going to rain on them all day long. Climate is key, and there are five climate variables you need to know because they will warm up a classroom and they will warm up some hearts. The first one is something called physical proximity. I understand that the, the lights have to be like this and I have to really basically stay on the stage, otherwise that camera will come up with a shadow and people will look at it and say, well, who, where did she go? <laughs> so, if it were not for that, I will be up and down these aisles because I believe in proximity. I believe in connecting with an audience. I believe in giving eye contact. Even when that eye is all red, I believe <laughs> that you must be able to move around the classroom if you're going to have an impact. Second climate variable is something called courtesy. Simple courtesy. Thank you for the good things you keep doing. Courtesy. Third climate variable is something called praise and affirmation. Girl, you're doing so much better today than you did last week. I'm so proud of you. Praise and affirmation. Got a real winner right here. Man, I am happy for you. Young man, where you been all my life? <laughs> praise and affirmation. Use it in a classroom. You're going to motivate more children. Fourth climate variable. It's called acceptance of feelings. You got a student feeling sad today, having a bad day. And you all need to know some children will have a bad day before they even get to the schoolhouse door. So instead of walking up to children and saying, I don't know what your problem is, I'm the one having a bad day. No. I want you to try something called feel, felt, found. Works like this. Young lady, I can imagine how you must feel today. You know, I've been in situations before, I felt the same thing. But this is what I found out. Feel felt found. It'll allow you to shed some pearls of wisdom and bond with a student in a unique and wonderful way. The fifth climate variable, it's called appreciation of differences. The teasing, the taunting that exists in many classrooms has to stop. And it stops when teachers create a climate in a classroom that is conducive to celebrating differences. The title of one of my books is called Dreaming of a PHAT Century. That is fat for those of you who don't know. But the fat book was written not just to develop character, which it certainly does, but it was written to provide strategies and activities and inspirational stories that would help people to embrace this thing called diversity. My friends, many of you are going to teach children who are going to grow up in a world that is far more diverse than anything we have ever seen. If we're not preparing young people to mix and mingle with others who are different, we have not served them well. Now, if we can put the right climate in place, how we communicate to students is also key to their development because communication is total person to total person. The child who goes home from school and says to a parent, the teacher doesn't like me, that child has not heard the words. We're too smart for that. We don't walk up to children as teachers and say, I hate your guts. I mean, I hope we don't. 
But when young people feel no love from educators, you know what they picked up on? Behavior that says it all. Communication is total person to total person. If I were to stand here right now and say, I like all of you, <laughs> somebody wouldn't believe me. And I said the words, but that was only 7% of what got communicated. 38% of what we communicate, we communicate through our rate of speaking. Ladies, did your mother ever tell you to watch out for fast talking men? <laughs> and see, now the research tells us it's the slow talkers we should worry about. <laughs> but rate of speaking, tone, anyone here ever been told, watch your tone? And what about volume? Don't you just love those people who say, I am not shouting! <laughs> rate, tone, volume. 38% of what we communicate, but 55% of what we communicate is communicated through body language. We communicate without ever opening our mouths. Now, if you don't want to believe me, there's a book called How to Read a Person Like a Book by Gerald Nirenberg. According to Gerald, there's some body language postures that send the wrong signal. Gerald cautions against the use of the folded arms. According to Gerald, this is a sign of defensiveness, hostility, a desire to be left alone. Hey, sometimes it's called <laughs> Cold right now. You're still defending yourself against the elements. Everything you do, my friends, is young people will take personal. Now, if we can put the right climate in place and develop teaching styles that are congruent with learning styles, if we can communicate in such a way that children understand that our hearts are in the right place, if we can do those things, we'll, we will enhance performance. Let me make sure that we all understand one thing. Ability test, achievement test, do not accurately measure ability. Can I get ahead now? No, they don't. There are snapshots of performance on a particular date and time. And who among us hasn't taken an exam and walked away from it saying, oh man, I know I knew that. an exam before. Let me see some hands. <laughs> the truth is, what we want our young people to do is to be so excited about learning that they perform at a high level and they do it consistently. The things that I've shared with you thus far will enhance performance, and I'm going to show you what I mean by example. I'm going to pretend to be two teachers. One is going to put in place everything you've already heard, and the other one will not, and you tell me which one you think is the most effective. I already know. First, I'll be Teacher X, and then I'm going to switch up on you and become Teacher Y. Now, this is Teacher X. Good evening, class. I said good evening. Oh, that's just fine. Oh, I know what to expect with this group. I had most of your brothers and sisters last year. But I'm teaching, and if you try very hard, you'll learn. I just got a memo from our superintendent. The memo says if you learn 20 words and phrases, you get an A in this class. Bet y'all aren't gonna make it. <laughs> I'm gonna do my part, I'm going to teach, and if you try very hard, you'll learn. Now the words and phrases are, paper door, bed, Bible, couples for a chair, window, flowers, nails, cup of water, flying carpet, good year, happy birthday banner, RFK, stadium, church, saints, minister, Sunday school. Now someone give me those words and phrases right now in order. <laughs> Oh, this is funny to you. Okay, what period is this? All right, maybe this is a slow group. I'll slow it up for this bunch. The words and phrases again. Paper, door, bed, Bible, covers, floor, chair, window, flowers, nails, cup, water, flying carpet. Good year, blimp! Happy birthday, banner, RFK, stadium, church, saints, minister, Sunday school. Now, someone give me those words and phrases right now in order. Yes, Dennis. You know, you're not trying. I can see you don't care now about your future. I'm teaching as hard as I can, but you are not trying to learn. And since you don't care about your futures, I don't care either. I'm giving all of you what you just earned. You have all just failed. Now laugh about that. Now 
little chilly in here, didn't it? <laughs> Let's change the style of the teacher. Let's change the climate of this classroom. Let's see if that doesn't change your performance. This is gonna be teacher Y. Good evening, class. Good evening. Oh, I know you all can do better than that. I got the best class in the school. Let me try that again. Good evening, class. Good evening. Ooh, am I excited? I am so excited. I'm almost out of breath. <laughs> got a memo from the superintendent. Memo says you learn 20 words and phrases, you automatically get an A in my class. I've been bragging all day. I told everyone I ran into on my way to class, every student in my class gets an A. Easiest A you'll ever get, but let me assure you, you're all going to get A's. Now I'm gonna give you the words and phrases, and then I'm going to make certain that you learn them. Now listen carefully. The words and phrases are, paper door, bed, Bible, colors, floor, chair, window, flowers, nails, cup, water, fine carpet, good, you blimp, happy birthday, banner, RFK, stadium, church, saints, minister, Sunday school. Don't worry about it, you are all going to learn these words. <laughs> but to make sure you do, I gotta tell you a little story. I was in a hotel room once, and someone came along, and they slid a sheet of paper right under my door, landed right by my bed on top of the Bible. I pushed the covers onto the floor, picked up a chair, threw it out of the window, landed in some flowers. I love flowers, but they turned to nails. So I picked up a cup, and I ran some water. Looked up and I saw a flying carpet the size of a Goodyear blimp, carrying a happy birthday banner, flying right over RFK Stadium, flew right into a church where there were some saints and a minister teaching Sunday school. Easy stuff. Now let's do it all together. Someone slid a sheet of paper right under my, door. landed right by my, Red. on top of the, Five. I pushed the, onto the, Four. picked up a, Six. threw it out of the, Six. landed in some, Five. I love flowers, but they turned to, Six. so I picked up a, Five. and I ran some, Four. looked up and I saw a, Five. the size of a, Six. carrying a, Six. flying right over, Six. flew right into a, Six. where there was some, Six. and uh, Six. teaching, Six. easy stuff. so smart. This class is so smart, you don't need that story. You can do it without the story. Let's do it without the story. Let's go. Let's go. take a rocket scientist to figure out what just happened. Would you all agree? I mean, seriously, bless his soul, Ray Charles could have seen what just happened in this room. <laughs> First of all, your ability did not change. Can I get a head nod? Yeah. But something did change. Climate of the classroom changed. Style of the teacher changed. And that in turn changed your performance. You can threaten students with failure, threaten to call their mama every day, but until we change how we teach, what we teach, we will not change the performance of our students. My friends, learning style differences don't affect ability, but they do affect performance. And if we want students to perform at the highest level possible, there are some things we must change. One of those things is a change in something called 
attitude. Do you all know how powerful attitude is? Well, it's a powerful thing. My children often tell me that our, there are some folks who do need a checkup from the neck up. <laughs> attitude is powerful, think about it. You could have a school that is the newest in the nation. You could be in a building that has the finest and most expensive landscaping anyone has ever seen. You could have the newest books, a computer at every desk, class sizes of five. <laughs> Y'all like that? Free valet parking <laughs> for all school employees, carpeting this thick in every classroom. But if the attitudes of the adults in that building are wrong, there will be no learning taking place. Attitude is that powerful. There are some attitudinal obstacles that will trip you up. You need to know what they are. Obstacle number one, it's called prior academic achievement. Whoa, is the child who starts kindergarten on the wrong foot. <laughs> Research says that they start off too slow or too bad in kindergarten, heaven help them. Because all too often, one teacher after another starts passing the word. Before the first week of school is over, the cafeteria workers have heard about it. Bus drivers know. School nurses have all been put on alert, and everyone in the building is buzzing. This one is slow. Now, all of us know by now, young people learn and grow at different rates. Can I get a head nod? Yeah. Now, anybody here who's a parent, and let me just see the hands of all the parents. If you're a parent, then I know you know that young people learn and grow at different rates. Can I get a head nod? Yeah. I know I learned it. My oldest daughter was eight months old, walking and talking. We were going, genius, look at this baby. <laughs> We're inviting all the neighbors by to watch. Come on, y'all, watch her walk. Go on, girl, walk for them. <laughs> we just knew she'd be president by the time she was 35. Now, she did graduate from college SGA president. She spent a few years working on Capitol Hill for a U.S. congresswoman, married off to a high-powered lobbyist, so you know we're still hopeful. <laughs> but then my baby girl came along, 17 months old, and we were still going, come on, honey, just one step. <laughs> one step. We didn't give up on her. We didn't assume she'd have to crawl into kindergarten. We didn't invite the neighbors by to watch either. <laughs> this girl not only walks, now she runs like an Olympic queen. But she started slow out of the blocks. There were some classes where she lost confidence, wanted to lose, just lost confidence altogether, wanted to just pull away from learning. But I'm fortunate that she was surrounded by some merchants of hope, just like you, who showed her through the power of love what this profession is all about. She decided she wanted to grow up to be like those who had inspired her the most. Well, you all need to know that not only was, has she been a school teacher now for five years, at the school where she teaches, she was voted two years of those five, teacher of the year. But last October, she was one of 100 educators chosen by the Milken Foundation to receive the big $25,000 check and the designation as National Educator of the Year. Thank you. My point is, you're going to see some students who stumbled. You're going to see some who have come from homes where parents didn't know they were supposed to teach them how to read and write before kindergarten. You're going to see some children who have come from homes where the motif is survival, where parents still believe that the adults receiving them at the schoolhouse though, will give them the learning they need. You're going to see some young people who won't come into their own until adolescence. But history is full of people who started slow. Albert Einstein did. And I tell you, you look at a picture of Albert Einstein. <laughs> Got that wild hair, that glass look in his eye. You know he looked the same way in elementary school? <laughs> but even though he had erratic behavior, even though he started slow, somebody was willing to believe that there was some genius in there. Hung in there with him. And the list just goes on and on. We're dealing with some young people who need to know that we've got educators who are willing to be the wind beneath their wings. We've become a society now that's gotten so accustomed to instant everything. Instant coffee, fast food, microwave popcorn. Somebody even told me now you can roast a turkey in 20 minutes. Don't you try it. <laughs> We're so accustomed to instant results. It's easy now to give up too soon when young people take too long. If we can hang in there with those who have yet to come into their own, we can make a difference. But then we have to get past the use of negative labels. And I believe that negative labels need to be eliminated because negative labels create negative expectations. And we should all know the power of expectations. There's another beatitude now that says, blessed are those who expect nothing, for they shall not be disappointed. <laughs> expectations dictate behavior. Remember teacher X. And our behavior has an impact on the performance of our students. Remember teacher Y. 
If we get past negative labels, we have to get past something else, something called socioeconomic status. Who is the child who comes from a home that, relatively speaking, is very poor. And I say relatively because whether you all know it or not, all of us are broke. I mean, some of us are just broke at a higher level. <laughs> Can I get ahead now? Yeah. I know I'm not the only one in this room who's ever experienced too much month at the end of the money. <laughs> Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Somebody doesn't even care if the ends meet as long as they wave at each other every now and then. But studies show that children are judged based on what the daddy does or doesn't do. We should know better by now. I had an audience once, a woman came in late, she had a question for me. She stood up, she said, Dr. Kirkendall, you're a PhD, JD, you've authored, you've lectured, you've gotten an earned doctorate, you've gotten an honorary doctorate, you've done so much with your life, you passed the bar exam on your first attempt after being out of law school for seven years. She said, but really, Dr. Kirkendall, she said, don't you have to admit, you succeeded because of your home. She said, wasn't it your parents who set the example, laid the foundation for your academic and professional success? She said, be honest and admit, you succeeded because of your parents. Well, I did have to be honest in responding, and I want you to know my answer. Because when it comes to talking about my parents, oh, I am what you might call a cultural chauvinist. That simply means you can't tell me that I didn't have the best mother in the whole wide world. Now, I know everybody feels that way about their mother, and you should. But you can't tell me that for me, my mother wasn't the greatest, the most giving, the most loving. If you're wondering why I put mother in past tense, it is because several years ago I had the misfortune of burying her. And mother's death was a tremendous loss. She was my best friend in the whole wide world. She was young only, 56. Pretty dynamic. Truly a joy to be around. But for all that she was, I have to be honest in letting you know there were limitations. But I don't mind telling you, I was born to a young mother, 19 years old, one year out of high school. I don't mind telling you that I was born to a mother who would later become a school crossing guard for over 20 years. That should give you some indication of her income. I don't mind telling you that I was born on a kitchen table in low income, two-story housing projects on the west side of Chicago. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Chicago, but let me assure you when you go, don't go west. <laughs> I don't mind telling you that my daddy dropped out of school in seventh grade. Daddy fought in World War II, honorably discharged. My daddy was cited for heroism. But all of my life, my daddy was a disabled veteran. And the government decided that because of the nature of daddy's war wounds, he would have to be 100% government support. So every month they would send daddy a stipend from Veterans Affairs. It wasn't a lot of money, but enough to let him feed a family. Daddy finally succumbed to his war wounds. We buried him nine years ago. But daddy went out like the hero I always thought he was. He did get a flag draped coffin and he got a 12-gun salute. But while both my parents were wonderful, loving people, they had limitations. You see, I didn't have parents who could do my science project on their job. I didn't have parents who could help me out with book reports and term papers to get them typed up by secretaries who could take care of grammatical errors. They couldn't tutor me to do well on the California achievements or the Iowa basics or the SAT or the ACT. In fact, my parents were even intimidated by the PTA. <laughs> They were too sophisticated. But I can stand before you as a professional who now has five advanced degrees because they were merchants of hope who chose to make a difference in my life. I made a decision. I made a decision to be a teacher because I fell in love in kindergarten. Now, my kindergarten teacher had to weigh about 700 pounds, but I said that with love. I love that woman. <laughs> Sitting on her lap was heaven. We just roll all around. You know, lean back. Some morning she would come in there feeling real good. She spread out. <laughs> Get five of us up there at one time, hold everybody. And hugging this woman was like taking a giant marshmallow. It was wonderful. And I was a slow start in kindergarten. Started school, could not write my name, did not know the alphabet, couldn't even count. My first day of school, I mean, my first day, because I was weak, they do, do the chicken pox. My first day of school, they let us out for morning recess. I went home. <laughs> My mother said, what are you doing here? I said, they let us out. You know, I was wondering why all those other children stopped to play. I went home. But there was a teacher who loved me anyway. And when I was even in kindergarten, I had tears streaming down my face. I said, I want to be a teacher. I want to be just like you. She said, baby, you're going to be better than me. 
I didn't think you'd get any better than that. Now the bubble did bust in first grade. My first grade teacher was so mean, so rough, in my first grade class, nobody saw Spot Run. <laughs> but I'm lucky. Because for me, the dream picked up again and again and again. Because there were merchants of hope just like you, who were willing to look past my poverty, willing to look past the slow start, to make a difference in the life of a poor black girl. But the truth is, many children born poor today won't be as fortunate because there are too many educators out there who judge children. Some of them buying it that myth. You heard the one that says the apple don't fall far from the tree. If you don't believe you can be a strong wind to take that apple to greener pastures, I'm offering you myself right now as exhibit A in evidence. You're more powerful than you know. But many children born poor today hear many more negative things said about them. Say, I'm lucky I came through at a time. Unlike today's children, I didn't know being poor meant being pitiful. In fact, you know, I didn't even know we were poor. I didn't find out poor we were until I was grown. I was grown when I found out we weren't poor. We were poor. <laughs> Could not afford the OR, just poor. <laughs> I was grown when I found out as a child I was culturally deprived, disadvantaged, and underprivileged. I had no idea. And then I found out in the 80s they added more adjectives to all of that. Now in addition to everything else, I realized I was also at risk, <laughs> latchkey, and came from a dysfunctional family. And you know what, they use that word dysfunctional, they want you to know something is seriously wrong. They spell it with a Y. <laughs> this is definitely bad here, I'm sorry. I'm like the poet who once wrote, I don't want anyone ever talking about my horrid childhood. They'll never understand. All the while, I was quite happy. If we can get past family income, research says you're gonna have to also move past something called physical attraction. Whoa, is the child who everyone agrees is ugly. Oh, studies show children are judged based on how they look, how they dress, wear their hair, and even how they smell. I've even heard adults refer to young people as FLKs, and I didn't know what that meant, so someone told me, girl, the FLKs are the funny looking kids. <laughs> funny looking kids. Right now, you're looking at the original FLK, right here in me. Now, of course, I think I'm fine now, but back then, I thought I was the ugliest child God had ever created. Long and lanky, I, I used to go to school, go to every class, I used to seat myself way in the back. Now, I'm not saying that's why you all are back there. I just didn't want to, you know, I thought I'd fade into the woodwork, didn't want a teacher to recognize me. But my parents always told me I looked good. This did nothing for my ego, though. I, I look like them. They were supposed to tell me I look good. My daddy would look at me and say, look at her, she's gonna be tall just like my sister Irene. That was my biggest fear. I didn't want to be that tall. She duck coming in the house. I didn't want that. So I used to walk around like this and hold my neck down, you know, like that would help. But I've never forgotten a counselor, a long, lanky woman herself. She told us she was six feet two. Beautiful woman, but the interesting thing about her, she was the first person I ever saw who only had one blue eye. So you know the word in the hood was six feet two, eye of blue. <laughs> one day she caught me slinging down the hall. She called me over, she said, come here, child. I said, yes. <laughs> She said, stand straight and tall. Stood straight, didn't want to straighten up my neck. I know it's the same neck now, but back then it seemed that long. As a little, little girl, I had six inch braids. It hit me right here. But I straightened up my neck. She said, girl, you are gorgeous. I said, I am. She said, you're beautiful. I said, for real? She said, but with that height, we have to show you how to walk with it. She had me strutting down the hall. I was telling boys, look, you don't even know what beauty is. Small thing, powerful impact. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And yet right here in the state of Maryland, we've got young girls turning to teen pregnancy, unsafe, deadly sex, just to find somebody, anybody, to love them for who they are. Fastest growing prison population, teenage girls across races. There's beauty in every person. It just takes another beautiful person to see it. The next time you're tempted to refer to a child as FLK, remember, I read a magazine article once and it did say one out of every four Americans really is ugly. <laughs> I just want all of you to remember that. The very next time you're sitting at a table of four, <laughs> just remember, on any given day, you might be the odd one out, all right? Count them up. Everything is relative. Now, if you can get past how they look, dress, wear their hair, or smell, we have to get past language differences, and they're here to stay. We have to get past gender bias or preference, and some of us will have to move past race, and even within a race, there's color. If we can move past differences, we can make a difference. But many of you are going to have to reach out more because you've got some colleagues. You will have colleagues who won't reach out enough. 
I had one, I wondered why he became an educator. We called him Sunshine. His attitude was so negative, every time he left his classroom, it lit up. <laughs> sunshine looked as though he had been weaned on a pickle. You know the look. I don't want you to be Sunshine. I want you to go out here knowing that you can make a difference. And you know what, my watch is telling me I'm fast running out of time. We got started a little bit late. And Laura told me to go ahead and take the full 60 minutes. So let me assure you, as Henry the Ape said to each one of his wives, I won't keep you much longer. <laughs> but I do want to put a plug in. There are, there are copies of my book, From Rage to Hope, out in the, on the table out there. You all need to know it is a national bestseller. We're very proud of that. If you are interested in getting your own personal autographed copy of From Rage to Hope, you can just meet me right outside. If, however, Laura's already told me I may run out of books, if I do, this is what I'm willing to do for you. We've got a shipment of books coming in tomorrow. If you do not get a book tonight, but you want one, you don't have to order it. If you still pay for it tonight, but on your check, if you're writing a check, we will put on the memo portion, mail, M-A-I-L, <laughs> rage, all right? And that way I will send you your book autographed. It will come to you priority mail, confirmed delivery. You will not have to pay the postage. The book is $25 even. And if you are writing a check, you want to make it payable to Kirk, K-I-R-K. The other book I have mentioned to you tonight, but unfortunately it is in the process of being totally redone, updated. It is the fat book as we call it. It is also $25 even. If you want to get a copy of the fat book, it won't be ready for two more weeks. Well, no, what's today? It'll be ready next week, actually. You can also get that one. There's some order forms out there as well. With my website on it, you can also go to my website and order anything you want with plastic. And my website is simply my name, www.crystalkirkendall.com. But I've got to bring this to a close. But let me bring it to a close by reminding you that as merchants of hope, I'm counting on all of you, whether you're a student in education, whether you're a practitioner, whether you're a retired person, whether you're a parent, whether you're somebody who saw the crowd and just walked in here tonight, <laughs> let me assure you that you have it within you, the power to make a difference in another life. And when you do that, you will make a difference in this world. But I want you to go forward tonight knowing that you have the power to give others something called CPR. And I don't mean a good old cardiopulmonary resuscitation, not that one. The CPR, which I speak, will allow you to save many more lives. The C really is your commitment. It is your consistent display of caring. It is your willingness to change. It is your compassion. Compassion is a chapter in the fat book because I have discovered you can't just have it yourself. You've got to develop it in others. And remember, my friends, young people will not care how much you know unless they know how much you care. The P in CPR, not just your patience, and it is a virtue. It is your persistence. Persistence is also a chapter in the fat book because it, too, is learned behavior. But you can't teach it unless you already have it. And when you teach children to persist, you help them to overcome something called fear of failure. Do you know what fear of failure does? Fear of failure will keep you from trying. Anyone here ever been skydiving? Okay, I see a few hands, but now the rest of you? Fear of failure. <laughs> or it will keep you from trying. But let me ask you this, anyone here ever learned how to ride a bicycle? Did you fall? More than once. But no one ever came over to you and said, stop! You've fallen twice. Back to the tricycle. <laughs> you don't know how to ride that bike because someone made you believe in yourself. Can I get a head nod? Yeah. You've got students who need to know they can ride the bike called reading. They can ride the bike called success. If I had more time tonight, I might do it tomorrow. So someone who's coming tomorrow morning, make sure you ask me a question on how to bring out strengths in children. Because when you can identify and build on strengths, you're going to make a powerful difference in that life. I thank God for a fifth grade teacher when I got to a point where I hated school. And you know why I hated school? Because every teacher I'd had before fifth grade used to make me write 5,000 times, I will not talk in class. <laughs> and they would say, bring it back tomorrow, signed by your mother. I hated school. <laughs> Until a wise fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Odom, one day when I was running my mouth like I always did, she came over to me and she said, young lady, you have a gift. I was getting ready to say, I didn't bring a present for anybody. <laughs> and then she said, you have the gift of gab. She said, you can talk. She said, and we're going to develop that gift. And when you talked as much as I did, you never completed assignments. 
Some magic words for me were extra credit. For extra credit, Mrs. Odom said, I want you to do an oral presentation on public speaking. And I remember going to the library, and I remember how excited I got, because I, I kept reading about people who got paid to run their mouths. <laughs> and I, I mean, when it came time to do my little three to five minute oral presentation, she said, no notes. She said, I want you to know your stuff, and you be able to talk it. And when I finished, she, she led the class with cheers. And I've never forgotten her, because she said, Crystal, if we can just get you out of fifth grade, I'm convinced one day you'll make a whole a lot of money talking. I'm so glad I listened to Mrs. Odom. <laughs> I took that lesson with me to the classroom. And when you can build on strength, you will make a difference. Mrs. Odom said if you study the third as much time as you spend jumping double dutch, you'd be a genius. Now I was a double dutch queen four years in a row. I had to work on my moves. <laughs> but I took her up on it, turned my life around. Once I became convinced that it really was a high road for this poor black girl, I started putting in time. And lo and behold, I came out of high school at the age of 16 with four scholarships. I was so grown. I came out of college at 19. I was real grown at 19. I got married at 19. In fact, many of my college friends claim I went to college looking for my MRS, you know, so I could leave with my BMW, <laughs> my black man working. <laughs> and I got one to look like a young Harry Belafonte. You know I thought I'd arrived. A year and a half after we were married, my husband and I moved east from the Midwest. Made that move with two suitcases between us and had everything we owned. Made that move with $200 and 16 cents, a baby and a car that we prayed would get us over the mountains. Got to New Jersey. Within two years, we accumulated all the material accoutrements of success. Suddenly we had two cars and both of them ran real good. We had two kids, they ran real good too. <laughs> Suddenly we had the two bedroom luxury apartment, doorman, swimming pool. You know we thought we had arrived. These two kids from the ghetto and we had a lot more than $200 between us. But I've never forgotten a summer night. Our children were back in Chicago with their grandparents. They had been gone all summer long. Of course, we missed the little darlings. <laughs> But this was a wonderful summer. We got down to the Thursday before the Sunday. Our children would do home. My husband said, baby, this is it. Last weekend. We knew come Sunday night when mother got off the plane with both babies. We knew it was back to the real world. We decided to have a private party, just the two of us. Got some sparkling apple cider, little gourmet deli platter from the place that sold the cider, and that night we got on the subject of how our lives had been turned around. I was telling my husband what a big dummy I was in first grade. He had one better than me. He told me he had been suspended from school twice in kindergarten. <laughs> I said, wait, 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 hold it, hold it, hold it. Not Mr. Attorney, not Mr. Success, not Mr. Responsibility, oh no, not you. Then he got suspended again in eighth grade for making a stink bomb. Got a chemistry set for Christmas. Spent the entire Christmas break mixing chemicals together so you could light a match to this mixture and stink up a room. His bomb was perfect. Had to take up to school, show everybody how good his stank. Set it off right outside his principal's office. Automatic three-day suspension. When he returned from suspension, the principal set him down and said, son, did you learn anything while you were away? He said, yes, sir. I should have been given academic credit. Nobody in this school could have made a bomb stink this good. He said, I'm willing to write it up as extra credit. I just think I should get something. Principal smiled and said, anyone who could make a case as good as you just did ought to get paid for it in a court of law. Planted a seed, took a negative, turned it into a positive, set that boy off on life's high road. As we swap stories, realized both of us had made it because one merchant of hope after another was willing to turn negatives into positives. That night I got excited because I realized each day I live, I get a chance to touch lives and make a difference. I got excited, but in the midst of our excitement, we ran out of apple cider. My husband said, I'll jog to the store, get a few more bottles, and then I'll jog right back. But on his way jogging right back, he was approached by three young drug addicts. In the process of robbing him, they blew his brains out. I didn't find out until the next day. And I went from being totally on top of the world to suddenly being lower than you could even imagine. I no longer wanted to live. I told my mother, raise my children. I told friends, you could have my clothes. I told my principal, I'll never teach again. Instead, I went back to Chicago with a decision to rot away. But it was at this point in my life that I learned the meaning of the R word. And the R in CPR is for resilience. Another chapter in the fat book. Because I have discovered that many of you are going to see some young folks who feel that they've already reached the edge. You're going to have to teach some young folks that rebounds exist in life, not just in basketball. Like many of the students you will serve, I was courting rejection. People reached out to help me and my attitude was, leave me alone. But I was dealing with merchants of hope. So the more I resisted, the more they persisted. 
Oh, it took some doing. But within two years, they not only restored my hope, they replenished my faith, resurrected my soul. Two years after that tragedy, I found myself in Atlanta, Georgia, finishing up requirements for a doctorate in education. And I got a call one night from my lawyer back in Jersey. He said, Crystal, there's a signed confession. There was now a young boy in a state mill institute for another crime. While there, he confessed to the murder of my husband. They had a hearing to determine his competence to go through a judicial sentencing. You know I was at the hearing. When all was said and done, they determined he was not competent. But in my heart, case closed. I left that room with a sense of relief. At least I knew what had happened that fateful night. But as I walked out into the foyer of the courthouse, approaching me was an old woman, hair as white as snow, glasses as thick as ice cubes. She was sobbing. Through her tears, she embraced me. I let her. Through her sobs, she told me she was this boy's grandmother. She let me know that she had raised him because his parents were killed in a car accident when he was a baby. She said, he's all I got. I didn't raise him to be a murderer. He really was a good boy. He was good to his grandmama. She said, he started school so fast, I thought he'd be something special. Research says many young people start fast. One study focusing on blacks and Hispanics found at the age of six, 80% feel good about themselves. At the age of 10, 20% still do. But at the age of 16, only 5% still do. Study submitted to the Justice Department just a few years ago looked at current trends. And that study found out that right now, a black boy born today anywhere in these United States has one in 684 chances of becoming a physicist, a one in 375 chances of becoming a doctor, a one in 99 chances of becoming a teacher, but a one in 20 chance of dying by homicide before he turns 21, and a one in three chance of becoming a part of the criminal justice system before the age of 30. And when I say criminal justice system, I'm not talking judges and attorneys. They'll be in jail, on trial, on probation, or on parole. Now that one in three is a national study. Some cities have done their own. Baltimore City, Maryland, 48%. Washington, D.C., 62%. Los Angeles City, it is eight out of 10. My friends, we can change those statistics. But when I think back to that old woman, I'm reminded that with tears streaming down her face, she said he got to those middle grades and started slipping. She said, I'm an old woman. I wish I'd had somebody to help me turn them around. I stopped her. The anger I felt in that courtroom had turned to compassion. I let that woman know my prayers would stay with her. But as I walked away from that woman, I realized that day, even though I had to raise two little girls as a widow, I realized I was one of the lucky ones. I had made it to life's high road, and I had made it because one merchant of hope after another was willing to take the time to make a difference in my life. I know now, long before that boy pulled that trigger, something inside of him had already died. I share that story with you not to sadden you, but to remind each one of you, you're more special, you're more powerful than you know. You can make the life of a child miserable or joyous. You can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. Or you can humiliate or humor. You can hurt or you can heal. In many ways, you will determine whether a child feels humanized or dehumanized. My friends, I know when you're down. When you're down, I know you're willing to reach up. I just hope that when you're up, you're always willing to reach down. Now, having said that, I can't let you go looking like this. <laughs> a few of you look like you're getting ready to start bawling on me, and that's with one good eye, so I know. <laughs> I've got to leave you laughing. Let me just say, if there's only one person, only one, who got something out of my remarks tonight, it was worth it. Giving up an evening with a 19-year-old who I know misses me. <laughs> if only one person heard me tonight, it was worth it. Coming out with one bad eye, getting stopped by Maryland's finest, if only one person heard me today, it was worth it. But just in case someone is sitting here and you heard something you don't intend to put to use, all you need to know there was once a cowboy like that. Got information it wasn't worth using either. Won a horse fast enough to get it from the East Coast to the West Coast in 36 hours. So I bought a horse right here in the state of Maryland from a horse farmer named Reverend Jones. Paid him cash money for a fast horse named Speedy. Cowboy was in a hurry. He said, look, I gotta get to California in 36 hours, man. I gotta go. Reverend Jones says, hold it. Let me give you some information. Cowboy said, I don't need it. I'm the best, I'm the brightest. I know where I'm going and I know how to get there. Reverend Jones says, you better listen. You need this information. He said, look, if you want this horse to go, remember, this horse only goes if you say, praise the Lord. And then he'll move at top speed. But he'll only stop if you say, amen. Cowboy said, yeah, 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 yeah. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. He bid Jones adieu, washed Speedy off, saddled him up, jumped into his riding clothes, jumped on top of Speedy, and he goes, giddy up. Well, Speedy just sat there. Come on, animal, move! 
Speedy's still sitting there, you dumb horse. Go, Speedy hasn't moved. Suddenly after you wasted your precious time, you remember. You said, wait a minute, I know, I know, I know, I know. Uh, um, uh, praise the Lord, Speedy shot out. This horse went leaping over the Appalachian Mountains. Boogity, 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 boogity. I mean, he was flying. Jumped over the Blue Ridge, leaped over the Great Smokies. He was loving it. Cowboy was, ears were popping. You know our ears pop when you're way above sea level? His ears were ringing. Jumped over the Mississippi River. Leaped over the archway in St. Louis. Saw the sun set, then he saw the sun rise again. Went flying through the Rocky Mountains. Jumped over the Grand Canyon. Leaped over Mount Rushmore. Jumped over the Salt Lake. Jumped over Pikes Peak. Not necessarily in that order, but he was flying. <laughs> boogity, 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 boogity. And all of a sudden he looked up and there it was, rippling water of the Pacific. He said, that's it, I made it, I made it! But his ears were still popping. Realized he was fast approaching a cliff, knew it had a five mile drop. So he started pulling on the reins. Whoa, boy, slow down, stop! Speedy kept moving, boogity, 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 boogity. Now his heart is beating fast. Palms are sweaty, stomach was about to come up out of his mouth. He could see it directly in front of him, the very, very edge of the cliff. He said, stop in every language he could think of. Speedy is still moving at top speed. Suddenly he got to the tip of the cliff. He could see the rocks below, but just in the nick of time, he remembered. And he said, amen! Speedy stopped dead on the money. Cowboy looked up and he said, praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.